During their three major wars against the Brotherhood of Nod, the Global Defense Initiative relied on an array of support structures. Structures used to repair vehicles, provide power and radar at a commander's base, and accommodate various means of fire support, all necessary to aid their forces on the battlefield. One, if not the most important support building, was the power plant. With the exception of the construction yard and minor defenses, all other base structures required power in order to function at an optimal level. During the alternate Second World War between the Allies and Soviet Union, both sides used coal-fired plants to generate power for their bases. There were two kinds of plants, the standard power plant and the advanced power plant. The standard plant was the cheapest and quickest to construct. It also took up less build space, but it generated the least amount of power. Advanced power plants were needed to support a larger base, and to handle the strains of more power-intensive buildings and defenses. Advanced power plants were more expensive and required more space to build, but they provided double the power of the standard plants. The design of both these plants was based off the real-life Battersea Power Station in London, England. Since the Battersea Power Station was a coal-fired plant, this leads me to believe that the ones used by the Allies and Soviets were the same. With the invention of the atomic bomb during the Second World War, both the Allies and Soviet Union had the means to cause mass destruction on a scale never before seen. After the war, scientists focused on harnessing the power of the atom as a source of clean, reliable energy. Thus, by the time of the First Tiberium War, most of the standard and advanced power plants used by the Global Defense Initiative and the Brotherhood of Nod were nuclear. We know these plants were nuclear thanks to the building's internal IDs, which were Nuke for the standard plant and Nuke 2 for the advanced plant. I also believe that these plants were SMRs, small modular reactors. This means they were a fraction of the size of a conventional reactor, not taking up too much space at a commander's base, leaving room for other vital structures while also generating enough power for those structures to function. In addition, the modular design of the plants made them cheap and quick to construct on site, that is, in comparison to a conventional nuclear plant. The standout features of these plants were their natural draft cooling towers and the C-shaped structures that partially surrounded the towers. The advanced plant had a second cooling tower to handle the extra heat generated by its secondary reactor. Due to their importance and base functionality, power plants needed protection. A damaged power plant meant less power, so it was important for the commander to repair the plant as quickly as possible. While some structures would still function in low power mode, they operated at reduced efficiency. Other structures, such as the communication center and advanced guard towers, wouldn't function at all if there wasn't enough power. This power plant design would continue to be used even in the later stages of the First Tiberium War, though its method of generating power would change, at least for some models. Like most structures, the interior facilities of the power plant extended underground. Located down here were various computer systems to monitor the building's functions. Included was the master control terminal that, if destroyed, would shut down the entire building. The Brotherhood of Nod version of this power plant had a more elaborate interior, which I intend to go over in a separate video. As mentioned, the Renegade power plant, as I'll call it, had a completely different method of generating power. The power core was located underground, and it involved a spinning mechanism that moved up and down in order to generate electricity. I have no idea how exactly this mechanism works, but if I were to put forth a theory, it might be connected to the Tesla technology used by the Soviets in the Second World War. Tesla coils, Tesla tanks, and troopers were used to combat the Allies during the war, but like the atomic inventions, the Tesla technology could have been repurposed for civilian uses, such as power generation. However, it seems that nuclear power was still more efficient, especially since it saw continued use for power generation long after the First Tiberium War. Communication centers were another structure used by both GDI and the Brotherhood. This blocky structure, utilizing many angles in its design, featured a comm tower and a couple of parabolic antennas. The communication center acted as the commander's radar, enabling long-range views of the battlefield and commanding units over great distances. Should the structure lose power, the radar would cease to function. The comm center was where the GDI commander would call for air support, which would arrive in the form of bombing runs conducted by A-10 Warthogs. 
Should a Nod commander manage to destroy this building, the GDI commander would be unable to launch said air support. Though I should note that this is strictly a feature of the Nod campaign. If a GDI commander wanted support from the Ion Cannon, they would have to construct an advanced communication center. The advanced comm center looked mostly the same as the standard one, albeit having two towers with small radar dishes attached to them, and a single large parabolic antenna. Once this structure was built, the GDI commander no longer needed the standard comm center, as the advanced one could perform all the same functions, but with the added benefit of being the uplink center for the ion cannon. Should the structure lose power though, the commander would lose their connection to the ion cannon until it was restored. While both GDI and NOD commanders could rely on engineers to repair their structures, vehicles would be fixed at a repair facility. Another legacy structure from the Second World War, the repair facility was a pad that automatically repaired any damaged vehicle that parked over it. This included both armored ground vehicles and VTOL aircraft. The pad could only repair a single vehicle at a time, and so long as the commander had enough credits, the facility would keep repairing the damaged vehicle. If under attack, the crew could still fight back while their vehicle was undergoing repairs. The rate of repair would be slowed based off how much damage the facility itself had sustained. Sometimes, a vehicle may not be worth repairing, and so it was better for the commander to sell it off, a process that could be done for any vehicle parked on the repair facility. This is another building where I don't really understand exactly how it's conducting vehicle repairs. There are no mechanics around the pad physically repairing the vehicle. The facility clearly has an underground component, given that the pad itself rises from underground when constructed. There is also this layer of circuits just below the surface plate of the pad itself, implying that this system is responsible for the actual repairs. Unfortunately, I feel like I have to chalk this one up to gameplay logic. Though if anyone has any ideas on how this facility is supposed to work, let me know in the comments. As Tiberium spread across the Earth, many humans contracted Tiberium-related illnesses, which usually resulted in death or mutation. Doctors and scientists set to work trying to develop a cure, though this would require extensive study and testing with patients and would be conducted at hospitals. GDI's leading Tiberium research scientist, Dr. Ignatio Mobius, often visited these hospitals. However, Mobius was a prime target for Nod to kill or capture, so his hospitals had to be protected by GDI forces. The most well-known example of this occurred in Bratislava, Slovakia, when Nod forces tried to assault the outskirts of the city, where Dr. Mobius had recently established a hospital dedicated to Tiberium research. A GDI commander and his forces defended the hospital, and eliminated Nod's presence in the area. Another building in GDI's repertoire, sometimes right next to a hospital, was the Technology Center. This building was a legacy design from the Second World War, used by both major powers. Its primary feature was the three glass domes in the middle of the building. There was a small, medium, and large dome. The primary purpose of this building was the development of new technologies. While it can be seen in many missions, I'll just mention the most notable ones. Dr. Wong conducted research on the ion cannon at one of these centers in Angola, Africa. At least up until the center was destroyed, and the doctor was assassinated by a Nod commando. This building was also sometimes called the Prison, which was a function it served in certain missions. Most well known of these was Friends of the Brotherhood, where GDI detained local political leaders in Sudan. Brotherhood forces were able to capture the building and free the pro nod prisoners. During a covert operation entitled Ground Zero, this building was used to host the Global Peace Conference. However, Nod launched a nuclear missile at the conference, and GDI forces had to evacuate the delegates before the nuke arrived. The Technology Center was also used by the Brotherhood of Nod, though I'd like to cover its use by them in a separate video. Even after GDI achieved victory over the Brotherhood at the end of the First Tiberium War, the organization continued to invest in its military, creating new vehicles, structures, and technologies. These would be paramount in supporting GDI during the Second Tiberium War against the Brotherhood in the year 2030. By this time, GDI used a new, more efficient power plant design. These new plants featured a single cooling tower, and three pads where the turbines were located. By default, the power plant was constructed with a single turbine. This was enough to power a small base, 
but further expansion required more power. Instead of constructing additional power plants though, the GDI commander could add up to two more power turbines on the empty pads of a single plant. Each turbine would increase the power output of the structure by 50% over a non-upgraded power plant. This was cheaper than constructing a whole new plant. This also meant GDI could build a base within a limited area. If the GDI commander found themselves in a situation where they didn't have sufficient power for their entire base, then the commander could shut down some buildings to free up power. This, quote, freed up power could then be redirected and used to bring more important structures online. The communication center was replaced with the radar installation, which performed the exact same function only with upgraded systems. Not having enough power could cause the radar to cease functioning, but an ion storm would do the same thing. The commander would be unable to make use of the installation until after the storm had passed. Large GDI bases would have their own electronic video agent, EVA, unit housed inside a radar installation. This was known thanks to the mission Needs of the Mini, where Anton Slavic tasked a Nod commander to retrieve one of GDI's EVAs to replace their former unit, Cabal, after it rebelled against humanity. During the initial development of this structure, it was intended to have room for a couple of additional upgrades, including an ion cannon uplink, drop pod, and or seeker control pod. These extensions would be moved to another building called the Upgrade Center. However, the Upgrade Center was an advanced structure that could only be built after a commander had built a tech center. The tech center was where GDI conducted its high-tech weapons research. Such a building was required if a commander wanted access to weapon systems such as the Ion Cannon, Disruptor, Mammoth Mark II Walker, and Firestorm Generator. This tech center was smaller than the original one used by GDI in the First Tiberium War, only featuring a single dome compared to the three domes sported by the original building. The Upgrade Center was where the GDI commander could gain access to some of the best support weapons in the organization's arsenal. It had two open slots, where two out of three add-ons could be built. So, if a commander wanted all three support add-ons, they would have to build a second Upgrade Center, which was expensive, both in price and power consumption. Without sufficient power, the support modules of the Upgrade Center would cease to function. One add-on was the Ion Cannon Uplink, which enabled the commander to link up with the Ion Cannon Satellite Network to conduct strikes against Nod forces nearly anywhere on the battlefield. Another add-on, the Drop Pod Control Plug, enabled the commander to call in reinforcements from Orbital Command Stations or the GDSS Philadelphia Space Station. Seven Drop Pods would land at the designated target each pod carrying a single veteran light infantryman or disc thrower, who, upon landfall, immediately exits the pod to engage nearby enemy units. The last add-on that could be made to the upgrade center was a Seeker Control Pod. The Seeker Control Pod stored droids called Hunter Seekers. Hunter Seekers were some of the most feared drones. When deployed onto the battlefield, there was nowhere to run or hide from them. The Hunter Seeker Droid is a lightning-fast drone unit that is deployed to clean up the battlefield. Hunter Seeker Droids randomly search out an enemy unit or structure and latch onto it. Once attached, the Hunter Seeker Droid will self-destruct, destroying itself and the object it is attached to. The unit cannot be controlled and will automatically seek prey when released. The Hunter Seeker Droid had advanced sensors that allowed it to detect Nod stealth units and base structures, making it a highly deadly weapon. So deadly, that Nod incorporated these drones into their own arsenal for use against GDI. There were no countermeasures against these droids. Not even Ion Storms could stop them, which is strange considering Ion Storms ground all other flying or hover vehicles, including the Limpet drones. While guaranteed to destroy any unit or structure, the droid's targeting parameters were always random, which may have led to its phase-out from GDI's arsenal at the end of the Second Tiberium War. This was in addition to the funding cuts the organization experienced after the war as well. Unlike the Brotherhood of Nod, who replaced their repair facility with a mobile repair vehicle, GDI chose to continue using the stationary platform. Like its predecessor, the service depot repaired both ground vehicles and aircraft, so long as the commander had enough credits. But unlike its predecessor, the service depot had an automated repair arm that was housed in a compartment next to the pad. The compartment would open and the arm would extend out to repair whatever vehicle was on the pad. 
In my opinion, this is definitely more authentic compared to the repair facility in Tiberian Dawn. The service depot would be phased out after the Second Tiberium War, replaced with automated repair drones that could loiter next to the war factory and airfield, automatically repairing any nearby damaged vehicles. In the aftermath of GDI's second victory against the Brotherhood of Nod and the quelling of Cabal's cyborg rebellion during the Firestorm Crisis, GDI shifted its priorities from military spending to Tiberium abatement. This not only meant the retirement of many of the organization's advanced weapon systems, but also the designing of newer, more cost-effective base structures. This shift in building design was perhaps most evident in GDI's power plants. The design of the new power plants took inspiration from the ones used in the First Tiberium War, and was described as both clean and efficient. But just like the Second Tib War plants, these new ones could be upgraded with a couple advanced turbines to generate twice as much power. Both turbines would be built at the same time, rather than separately like the previous version. Power plants were essential to keeping base defenses functioning, as well as other support structures, including the Command Post, Armory, Technology Center, and Space Command uplink. If a commander didn't have enough power for all base functions, and lacked an MCV to construct additional power plants, he could cut power to one building in order to bring another, more important building or defense turret online. Such a tactic was instrumental during the Third Tiberium War, when Nod launched an attack on a GDI base in Croatia. The unnamed commander assigned to protect the base had to juggle turning defense turrets on and off based off the direction of the Nod assaults. It wasn't until reinforcements arrived with an MCV that the GDI commander was able to expand the base and launch a counterattack against Nod forces, eventually driving them out of the region. The radar installation was replaced with a command post, which performed the same essential functions. GDI forward bases act as the hubs for GDI operations in all zones and weather conditions. The heart of any GDI forward base is the command post. From this structure, field commanders can maintain contact with regional GDI resources and centralize intelligence for rapid response. High-powered radar and communications equipment allow officers real-time feedback from units in the field, but note that this gear will draw significant power from your base grid. In terms of support powers with the command post, a commander was able to perform a radar scan of the battlefield and locate enemy bases and unit movements through the fog of war. The radar scan was even strong enough to detect stealth units and structures. Sonic repulsion fields could be procured from the post. These fences could prevent Nod saboteurs and Skrin assimilators from infiltrating and capturing any GDI buildings they surrounded, in addition to making them a little more resistant to enemy fire. The command post also provided valuable upgrades to the commander's forces. Watchtowers, APCs, and riflemen could receive AP ammo for their weapons, making them more effective against enemy light armor units. Zone troopers and raiders could acquire scanner packs from this structure, enabling them to detect enemy units further away and revealing stealth assets. These packs used to be stored at the armory, but were moved to the command post. Sensor pods for GDI's Orca assault craft were procured from this structure too. An Orca could deploy one of these sensors on the ground to see through the fog of war, and detect nearby stealth units or structures. The pod itself was difficult for an enemy to detect without the proper sensors. However, it had a limited battery life and would cease functioning after some time. The sensor pod could even be attached to a unit or structure. Sensor pods were previously acquired at a technology center, but were moved to the command post in the Kane's Wrath expansion. Additionally, the model representing the sensor pods was changed from a disc-shaped module to the upright green scanner module, which was previously used to represent Zone Trooper's scanner packs. Speaking of the technology center, the newly designed building was two stories tall and had an observatory at the top. The building was necessary for our commander to call in additional off-map support in the form of sharpshooter teams. Sharpshooter teams were veteran sniper teams that could be deployed almost anywhere on the battlefield via V-35 Ox transports. For the Steel Talents Combat Technology Division, their scientists at the center were able to outfit the division's railguns with accelerators. These accelerators would boost the rate of fire for their forces' railguns. However, the extra heat generated by the increased fire rate would damage the railgun-equipped units and structures over time. The tech center had four enclosed spaces for upgrades the commander could procure. 
The first was an upgrade specific to GDI's Pitbull scout vehicles. The Pitbulls could be equipped with a mortar, attached to the very back of the vehicle. The shells for the mortars would be kept in a bin and transferred by a small crane. The mortars themselves had excellent splash damage, able to effectively eliminate enemy infantry. Additionally, the mortars, fielded in large enough numbers, were great at bringing structures crumbling to the ground. The second upgrade was tungsten shells. While GDI's AA batteries and slingshots could handle small numbers of light enemy aircraft, they had trouble dealing with heavier foes such as Nod's Vertigo Bombers or the Skrin's planetary assault carriers. Tungsten shells helped to deal with these threats, the bullets having improved penetrative power against the armor of these heavier aircraft. The tungsten shells upgrade was portrayed by a disc-shaped module, the same one used to represent the scanner packs upgrade for zone troopers. The third upgrade was railguns. While being the most expensive, these weapons were the most powerful a commander could acquire for their mammoth and predator tanks, guardian cannons, and the steel talon signature Titan mech walkers. Railguns had exceptional accuracy and could effectively destroy any ground unit or base structure. The fourth and final slot would be occupied by a steel talon's exclusive technology called adaptive armor. This armor was stored inside a crate and could be outfitted onto the division's titans and mammoth tanks to increase their survivability on the front lines. When activated, the armor would temporarily increase the vehicle's damage resistance and make them immune to EMP attacks, but at the cost of having a slower fire rate. Initially, Strato Fighter boosters could only be procured at the tech center, but as the tactical value of these boosters increased, with commanders consistently upgrading their firehawks with these boosters, they were made available for procurement at GDI airfields. Airfields had limited space for aircraft, so if a commander felt they needed additional landing pads to support more frontline aircraft, they would have to construct a combat support airfield. Combat support airfields could perform most of the same functions as the primary field, including refueling, rearming, and repairing aircraft. When it came to providing support and equipment for their infantry divisions, commanders would construct an armory. Not only could this building outfit GDI infantry with better equipment, but it also contained a medical bay for injured soldiers to heal any wounds sustained on the battlefield. Grenadiers could acquire EMP grenades from the armory, which, when used against an enemy vehicle or building, would disable their electrical systems, causing them to go offline for a few seconds. Riflemen, missile, and grenadier squads would be outfitted with composite armor, which provided greater damage resistance against various ballistic and explosive weapons. For GDI's ZOCOM division, operating in the harsh environments of Earth's Tiberium-infested red zones, their infantry could acquire Tiberium field suits. In addition to providing the extra armored protection of composite armor, these field suits protected ZOCOM's infantry units from the deadly effects of Tiberium, enabling them to pass through fields of the crystal unharmed. Zone troopers and zone raiders acquired power packs from the armory, which boosted the armor of their suits, and came equipped with medical systems that would passively, but slowly, heal them of any injuries sustained in combat. Outside these equipment upgrades, the armory enabled a GDI commander to call an airborne infantry reinforcements from outside the battlefield. Four V-35 Ox transports would drop off two riflemen and two missile squads, all of whom were well-trained, experienced veterans. If a commander needed to establish a new base quickly, they could build a crane to help construct buildings. If a forward base needs to go up fast, consider building a crane to open up a second production queue at the construction yard. The nano-assemblers, computers, and control units will be able to work on two base structures simultaneously. The crane could construct all structures except defense turrets or superweapons, as they still fell under the supervision of those engineers at the MCV. While idle, the operator would move and stack boxes of building materials around the crane. The last major support structure at a GDI base was the Space Command Uplink, a combined communications array and rocket launch pad. This structure enabled the commander to call on various means of fire support and reinforcements, largely associated with GDI's Space Force. The launch of the orange rocket at the pad indicated the commander was calling in a shockwave artillery strike. Though they lacked raw explosive power, only able to reliably eliminate infantry, these shells were equipped with an EMP warhead that would disable enemy vehicles and structures for a short time. 
The GDI commander could hit those disabled assets with a follow-up attack via an orbital bombardment. Dropped from an orbiting satellite at high speeds, these telephone pole-sized metal rods didn't contain any explosives, with their destructive power coming from the impact they made when striking the designated target. To deal with enemy aircraft, especially those that flew in close formation, a supersonic airstrike could be called in to eliminate them. This airstrike is unique in that the supersonic fighter jets used a powerful sonic boom to destroy the airframes of light aircraft. While heavier aircraft could survive the strike, they would take noticeable damage and could be finished off by ground anti-air weapons or firehawks. Finally, zone troopers stationed on orbital platforms could be called down using the Space Command uplink. Three squads of these veteran troopers would arrive planetside inside a drop pod, acting as reinforcements to support GDI forces across the battlefields of Earth. Instead of the zone troopers of GDI's standard divisions, ZOCOM would call on their own unique zone raider squads as drop pod reinforcements. Not all support structures were located at GDI's frontline military bases. One of these structures was the GDI Administration Center. Taking inspiration from the pyramidal design of some of Nod's structures, four of these administration centers were located in Rio de Janeiro. While the city was officially under GDI control, there was great resentment against the organization. Resentment that Kane would exploit by igniting a rebellion within the city. This rebellion was successful, with many residents joining the ranks of the Brotherhood and helping them destroy these administration centers. Four radio stations that telegraphed GDI propaganda were also destroyed during the Rio insurrection. Originally, these buildings were meant to serve as GDI's new barracks, but were repurposed to fulfill other roles such as the aforementioned radio stations. However, these buildings also acted as research labs and network centers located in various blue and even yellow zones across the planet. This included one located in the Australian outback near a Tiberium research facility. The lab and research facility were both destroyed by the Black Hand as a grand gesture to signify the return of Kane as leader of the Brotherhood. Four of these buildings, called Network Research Centers, were located in Johannesburg, South Africa, where they were infiltrated by Nod saboteurs looking for information regarding any weakness in GDI's ASAT defense network. GDI's leading Tiberium research scientist, Dr. Alphonse Giraud, conducted his work at one of these labs in the Chilean Blue Zone. The Doctor would later be captured by the Brotherhood and coerced to work for them. One of these labs, specifically named the Future Tech Lab, was located in Munich, Germany. A GDI engineer was able to secure the lab during the Skrin's assault on the city. A couple more of these research labs were located in Australia. One in the Australian Outback housed information regarding GDI's nuclear warheads. A Nod saboteur may have infiltrated the lab to retrieve the information. The warheads were being transported by convoy when Nod seized the weapons for themselves, just as the Skrin launched their invasion of Earth. The other was located within the Sydney city wall. A saboteur infiltrated this structure to retrieve the launch codes for the nuclear warheads Nod had previously captured. Along with these research labs, there were large antenna arrays called communication centers, also known as ASAT defense centers. These structures maintain a connection to GDI's ASAT defense network, an orbital necklace of death based on space infrastructure involving kinetic kill weapons, lasers, ion cannons, and drop pod assault platforms. Such a network hindered Nod's ability to combat GDI directly. Only after Nod had successfully destroyed one of these structures at the Goddard Space Center, were they able to effectively engage GDI in open combat during the Third Tiberium War. In addition to Goddard Space Center, this structure was located at other important sites, such as GDI's base in Johannesburg, the Chilean Blue Zone, and the GDI Treasury Complex. There was a GDI research facility that was owned by the Steel Talons located along the Australian coast. This facility housed Nod's stealth technology, captured after the Brotherhood's defeat at the end of the Second Tiberium War. The technology was neither exploited or understood by GDI, with the facility at some point being abandoned. Kane ordered Legion to capture the facility, reclaiming the technology for the Brotherhood. Before the Skren launched their attack on the city of Munich, they sent in a mastermind to shut down the city's primary defenses. To accomplish this task, the Mastermind controlled a GDI engineer stationed at one of the organization's barracks. 
This screen-controlled engineer made his way to a unique building called the Defense Center. The structure was the central control station for the city's defense grid. Just like the research lab, this defense center was originally intended to be used as a new war factory, but was repurposed to function as Munich's central defense center. The mind-controlled engineer infiltrated this facility and shut down the city's defense grid, allowing the Skrin to launch a full assault against Munich, causing massive destruction and casualties to GDI military forces and civilians. When GDI acquired the Tacitus at the end of the Second Tiberium War, they continuously used the data matrix to extract as much knowledge as they could from it. While GDI was able to obtain some information that could contribute to the development of new technologies, they never fully understood the true value of the Tacitus, unlike Nod's leader, Kane. After the Brotherhood failed to recover the Tacitus off the coast of China during the Third Tiberium War, the data matrix was relocated to the Rocky Mountains Research Complex in the United States. There, GDI's ZOCOM division performed various experiments on the data matrix, at a structure called the Tacitus Containment Facility. GDI's experiments had rendered the Tacitus dangerously unstable. So much so, that Kane feared the artifact would soon self-destruct. Thankfully for the Brotherhood, Legion, commanding both the Marked of Kane and Black Hand, was able to push through the GDI defenders and recover the Tacitus by capturing the containment facility. Last was a structure used by the Steel Talent in 2034 called the Pulse Scanner. While more of a defensive emplacement than a support one, these scanners alerted the Steel Talons of Nod units within their general vicinity. A small force of Talon units would be sent to engage the Nod forces, unless they were able to destroy the Pulse Scanners before the alert. Five of these scanners were placed around the Black Hand's fortress, run by Brother Marcion, to monitor his separatist branch of the Brotherhood in that region of Australia. These scanners would be destroyed by Legion's own Nod forces when assaulting the fortress, capturing Brother Marcion and bringing him back into the fold of the Greater Brotherhood under the leadership of Kane. All means of military support were utilized by GDI during the Third Tiberium War, first against the Brotherhood of Nod, and later the extraterrestrial Skrin. While they were able to achieve victory against both factions, GDI will have to prepare for whatever challenges lay ahead in the organization's future. From continued Tiberian proliferation, to the possibility of another Skrin invasion, GDI will need all the help it can get from its scientists and engineers, developing new technologies and labs, and rebuilding vital infrastructure to support military and Tiberium abatement operations across the planet. <laughs>